the first hadith is about men towards women and the second one is about women towards men. The first hadith is from uh, Abu Huraira anhu, and it's muttafaqun alayh which means it's related in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim which means it's the soundest form of hadith outside of what's called mutawatir uh, which is multiply transmitted to the point where it's impossible that it could have been uh, a lie or some mistake in it. Uh, and this hadith says, Tunkahu al-mar'atu li arba'in. A woman is married for four reasons. Limaliha. The first reason is wealth. So there are people that marry for wealth. And very common. Wealthy people tend to like to marry wealthy people. And there's a number of reasons for that. And that's certainly acceptable in Islam. There's nothing against that. I mean, it's just an acceptable thing. It's not encouraged by, or anything, but it's acceptable. And some of the ulama consider, scholars consider, that wealth is a type of kafa'a, that it's good for somebody from one socioeconomic class to marry somebody from a similar socioeconomic class because uh, if somebody was raised with a certain level uh, of opulence or a certain level of standard of living and then they marry considerably under that, that can be quite traumatic for that person uh, and it can lead to problems. And that often happens when people marry for love, uh, like a romantic type of love. Uh, so wealth generally in Islam is property and liquid assets and liquidity that you have capital. I mean, that's wealth. So the, the first is for wealth. The second is for what's called uh, hasab. Li hasabiha. Hasab, there are two concepts in, in, in Arabic. Nasab and hasab. Nasab is your lineage. It's who you come from. So it would be either your, your clan in Arabia or your family in, uh, in, in most other places. So generally lineage, but in, in the Shafi'i Madhab, he considers lineage to be a valid uh, reason uh, for refusing uh, somebody in marriage. Imam Malik does not. So these are ishtihadat uh, that the ulama differed about. And uh, lineage is certainly like in certain communities, like for instance, uh, in some Arabic communities, also for instance, in a Somali community. You know, Somalis have, I mean, there, there are Somalis that they can take their lineage of marriage back like 30 generations. And so if you marry outside of the, that clan and you marry another clan, it's considered a calamity, right? So those things here in America should not be real considerations for us. Those are, I think, problems in the Muslim world. But good family uh, does have meaning. So you can look at Nesab as just what good families are. And good families, just like uh, in the non-Muslim culture here, there are families that have uh, good character, uh, generosity, uh, religious. Now, Hasab, and there's different riwayah about this, but Hasab is what your ancestors have done that, that distinguish you. So for instance, if you're related to somebody great in history, then that's part of your hasab. So if somebody's uh, ancestor was a king or, or an ancestor was a great writer, like if, if you're the son or daughter of uh, T.S. Eliot, right, who was a great poet, uh, then that's a hasab. Because people who know Eliot, they're going to be, oh, really, you're his grandson or his grand, it all, it strikes an interest just automatically. That's what hasab is. It gives you a type of standing amongst people because of distinguishing characteristics of your ancestors. So there's, there's a natural inclination in the human heart to children of great people. It's just something that Allah has put. And that's what marrying for hasab is. It's like, oh, I really want to marry this person. Why? Well, their great grandfather was such and such. I mean, that's, it's like an honor to be in that, you see. So that's hasab. And then li jamaliha, for her beauty. 
you marry them for their physical appearance. And then the last one is Lidiniha. And then the Prophet said, and Deen here means, I mean, I would interpret this not necessarily as, especially in our time, not necessarily as religiosity or some of the outward trappings that people view as religious. Um, because you can go into some cultures where all the outward religiosity aspects are there. I would see this more as uh, the person who is aware of the nature of the world. That they're actually not oriented towards the dunya. They're oriented towards the akhirah. And that can translate in a lot of different ways. Because the, the nature of a person who has deen is that they're not worldly by nature. That their desire is not the accumulation of stuff. It's the accumulation of good actions. And that can translate in a lot of ways. So uh, you can see people that, that have that. I mean, it might not be as black and white as people would like to think. And so you have to be careful about that. Because uh, you can marry somebody that looks outwardly, the package looks all right. But then you find out, you know, it's all about bangles and, you know, the, it's all, it's some real dunyawi orientation. And then you can see somebody else, the package might not look there, but the internal reality of the person is, is that they are oriented towards the akhirah. So you have to be aware of that. Uh, but the Prophet ﷺ did say, فَضْفَرْ بِذَاتِ الدِّينِ تَرِبَتْ يَدَكِ Fadfar, uh, Fadfar means like to gain, you know, to take the prize, you know, to, you know, seize the one who has deen. Taribat yadak. It means like, may your hands be filled with dust, which the Arabs use it to the opposite meaning, and you'll be successful. Now, the idea here is that if you look at those three things, uh, if you look at the first one, which is wealth, wealth can, can be lost. So somebody might be wealthy today, they had all their money in stock market, and then the next day they don't have anything. So is your love still there? Because if you married them for that reason and they lose that thing, then the reason that you were attracted to that person is no longer there, so maybe the attraction won't be there anymore. The same is true of hasab. Hasab is about fathers and ancestors. It's not about that person. So after you marry that person, the initial interest you know suddenly you have to deal with the fact maybe this person isn't a good person maybe their father or their grandfather was a good person but they're not a good person they're a horrible person and so all that's left is for you to go around well at least she's the daughter of so and so you know i mean that's that's what you're stuck with <laughs> which might not be the best uh, grounds for a good marriage and then Finally, beauty, I mean, beauty, one, initial attractions. If, you, if you're seeing a person every day, you start losing that, you know, the first attraction of beauty, right? So you get used to a person, and, that, and that's something very common. So you're attracted to somebody for outward reasons initially, but again, you might lose the appreciation that the, the first thing it be just becomes something that you get used to seeing and then you see them because people can look very beautiful but when you live with them uh, you see their bad days right and suddenly you know the ephemeral nature of beauty which you know people can look really bad even beautiful people can look really bad on a bad day and, and the face is strange in that it's very malleable. It's, it's very, uh, and as you get older, it gets more, you know, you can really see differences. So if that's the reason you married a person, you're going to start, the eye will start wandering and, and you start being attracted to uh, other sources of beauty. So again, those three are all ephemeral reasons. And what the Prophet is saying, marry somebody for something that lasts, not for something that doesn't last. And the only thing that lasts is the deen. I mean, that is what lasts. And that's why you should marry a person, for what lasts. And he said, if you do that, you'll be successful in your marriage. And if you do it for those other reasons, it's not a guarantee of success. I mean, maybe it will become a successful marriage, but 
blame yourself if it's not. But if you married somebody on a strong foundation, because the beauty of Islam is that marriages really can be worked out if we adhere to first principles in our deen, rights and responsibilities, because usually things can be sorted out. If somebody's not doing something according uh, to the deen, then if, if there's somebody of deen and it's pointed out to them, they have to respond. Right? The onus is on them. So the idea of marrying not just for deen, but khuluq, of looking into the character of this person. And one of the things is to get them angry and see how they react. <laughs> now the second uh, hadith about this is the hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu said, مَنْ جَأَكَ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقُهُ فَزَوِّجُهُ مَنْ جَأَكُمْ Whoever comes to you and you are pleased with his deen, this is about men. You're pleased with his deen, wa khuluqa, which is really important. Deen and character. And I, I love that addition because, see, somebody can have relig a religious, but they don't have khuluq. They don't have character. And the thing is, is that the Prophet ﷺ said, Innama bu'itu li utamima makaram al akhlaq. I was only sent to complete noble character. So khuluq is really an important part of living with somebody, especially from the man's point of view. I mean, I find it interesting that in this hadith, it's not mentioned li diniha wa li khuluqiha, it's just li diniha. But in the other hadith, man tardawna deenahu wa khuluqahu, his deen and his khuluq, because it's more important that the man have khuluq than the woman. Do you see, that is more important. And the reason for that is because the woman is in a weaker position by the nature of the majority of marriages. In other words, you don't want to marry your daughter to somebody who is not going to treat her well. So you have to look not just to his religion, but to his character, because somebody can be religious, but they're easily angered. And that's why Muawiyah was very religious. But when the Prophet ﷺ, somebody asked him about marrying Muawiyah, he said, don't marry him. Why? Because he was su'luk. And when he asked about another sahaba, he said, لا يرفع عصاه عن عتقه. He doesn't take his stick off his shoulder. And the ulama interpreted it two ways. One, he travels all the time, which is not good for a woman. And two, uh, he beats his wife. So he was telling, you don't want to marry him. And he left it ambiguous. Right? Because that was his nature, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But it's not ghibah because it's nasiha, it's, it's good advice. You're not backbiting when you're giving somebody advice. So if somebody angers easily, you don't want to marry your daughter to that person. And a woman doesn't want to be under somebody who gets angry easy because what happens when people get angry? They do things that they don't mean. And then you go into uh, this uh, cycle, this dysfunctional cycle of, you know, the husband beats the wife and then apologizes and then and it becomes a very uh, unhealthy uh, cycle. So the idea of marrying not just for deen but khuluq, of looking into the character of this person. And one of the things is to get them angry and see how they react. <laughs> right? and it's very interesting and people traditionally did that. They got people angry just to see how they reacted. And that was a traditional way of, of testing somebody. Uh, so you, you want to have somebody who has good Deen, but also good khuluq. Now, what did the Prophet ﷺ say? Uh, if you don't do this, there will be tribulation in the earth and widespread uh, corruption. Now, this is really important to, to understand because at the essence of the deen of Islam is an understanding that the deen functions in ideal conditions. And when the conditions are not ideal, people deviate. Do you see? And that is why there's always an attempt to facilitate people's deen in the world. And that's why Allah is merciful because so much of the deen, that's, there's a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said about the people in the end of time, they would have the reward of 50 of, of, of you. And the, the Sahaba said, 50 of us? Why is that? And he said, because you have helpers supporting you in your struggle with your, you know, to please Allah. But those people won't have any supporters. 
In other words, it'll be so difficult in those days that their reward will be greater because the society is not facilitating that. So this is really important to note that if you don't help people get married, that's how corruption emerges, right? You, you get people that just by the overwhelming power of their appetites, their emotions, they can actually uh, do things that had they been facilitated, they wouldn't have done that. So that's really important to remember, especially now because it's really difficult. We have big problems in that area. It's, it's, it's good to help people get married. And there are many hadiths about uh, the importance of that. And there's verses in the Quran about that, that Allah will enrich them even if they're poor. So those are the two hadiths uh, that are at the root of marriage. One, marry your daughters to people who have good deen, but also who have good character. And two, when you look for a woman, look for her deen. Right? Look for, for her deen, because that's going to, to determine quite a bit of what type of relationship you're going to have. And as you get older, and the novelties wear off, and, and those things, um, the spiritual aspect, of your life together and the journey that you're on becomes more and more important. And the Prophet used to do dishes. He sewed his own clothes. He sewed his sandals, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He needed bread. He did things in the house. And the woman, the husband has no right to force a woman to work outside of the home or to do work that is usually associated with a craft or a profession because it's wage work. Just, you know, in noting this, the man should nonetheless help the wife in the house, even if he's working outside. And that was the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet used to do dishes, he sewed his own clothes, he sewed his sandals, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He needed bread. He did things in the house. So that's important to remember that you're doing it. It's a sunnah. And, I, you know, I was with a friend of Shaykh Abdullah al-Qadi's in the Emirates, and this little boy came in, and he started playing with him, and he was saying he'd make animal sounds. And then he'd ask the little boy, what animal is that? And the boy would say, and he, and he was playing with him. And then when the boy left, he finished, he said, the Prophet ﷺ, he used to play with children and, and I love to make the intention of fulfilling that sunnah before I do that. So he was actually fulfilling a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in doing that. And that's why if you're in your house and you do that, and تحتسب عند Allah, you know, that you just consider a reward with Allah, it's not a waste of time. Because there are people who say, ah, it's a waste of time, or I don't have time. Well, what about her? I mean, her time's as precious as your time in the world. So the idea, and, and Aisha radiallahu anha, when she said, uh, they asked him, how was the Prophet in, in the house? She said, Kana fi mihnati ahli. He was in the mihna of his family. And, and it's a beautiful word because she didn't say, Kana fi khidmati ahlihi. She said, Kana fi mihnati ahlihi. And mahna, the word comes from that which is servile or degrading. And the Prophet ﷺ would never do anything servile or degrading. But the point I think that she was emphasizing was that chores that you people might consider to be maheen, to be low things, he didn't elevate himself above them. And the idea is that any halal work is not degrading. If it's halal, it's not degrading, even if it's what we would call a menial task. The fact that the best of creation did it, including carrying wood, milking a, a goat. He did all of those things. So anybody that does those things is not degraded by doing those things by the mere fact that the best of Allah's creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did those things. Qadhi Abu Bakr said that the best things that a man can serve himself in are those things that relate to his own ibadah, like getting your own wudu water, those type things, preparing the ghusl. I mean, obviously in pre modern times that was much much more common in the world than it is now but it's still there are still a lot of places Ibn Abbas said that the Prophet 
rose in the night and he would go to the water skin, untie it and get his own wudu water. Even though he had servants in the house. I mean, there were servants in the house. The Prophet ﷺ had servants. So the fact that he did that is, is a sign. That's in Sahih Muslim. I mean, there's this idea that a lot of Muslims have that she's just supposed to do whatever he says and be this slavish, obedient servant in the house. It's not true. She can refuse things that she doesn't have to do. So it's binding upon a woman to willingly obey the husband if he commands her to fulfill any right binding upon her. So when you see the verse, about obeying your husband. It has to do with hukuk. You see, if it's his haq, and it, if it's not a haq, then you don't have to do it. So it's important to understand that. That you, once you know what your rights are, then you know what the limits of your... Because he has to be obedient in fulfilling his rights to you as well. And that's the important thing to know. It doesn't mean, I mean, there's this idea that a lot of Muslims have that she's just supposed to do whatever he says and be this slavish, obedient servant in the house. It's not true. She can refuse things that she doesn't have to do. She has every right to refuse to cook for his guests. Right? In, in Maliki Medhab and in Shavi Medhab, she doesn't have to cook, period. Right? So, and she can say, go cook for yourself. I mean, I'm not encouraging that because there's a hadith. There's a hadith, man khabbaba imra'atu ala imra'atan ala zawjiha, you know, falaysa uh, minni. The one that ruins the relationship between a man and his wife isn't from me. So I don't want to encourage any, but I, I want people to realize that, you know, that we have to honor the women and their rights, right? So the point is, is that when Allah says obedience, He's talking about the hukuk. That's where the obedience is. So if you know what the rights are, then that's why if he says we're moving to this house uh, and it's, it's within those four, uh, then she says, no, that's disobedience. Do you see? And now he has a haq because she's nashiza. I mean, she's in a state of disobedience. Do you see? Because she's stinting on his right. So it's important to know when this works and when it doesn't work but it doesn't mean that he that she's just in submission to this man no but but in certain things yes so these are the hukuk so once you know that so that is a haq of the man and then another important is adhering to the principles of forgiveness that really forgiving and just letting it go and one of the things that people in relationships will do is they'll hold on to these things and it's really it's just infantile behavior and you have to see it for what it is it's you're a pouting little child that's all you're doing and you're trying to make the other person miserable for doing something to you that it's infantile behavior and you need to snap out of it and we all will fall into that but you have to snap out of it and just remind yourself and if the other person reminds you of it take the reminder don't make your life miserable for yourself and for others because that's all it is and and it doesn't in the end of the day it doesn't matter so if something happens that upsets you just let it go and there, there, it will happen. It'll happen many, many times throughout your life. But just let it go. Don't hold on to it. The danger is not that it happens. That's going to happen. It's a given. The danger is that you never learn to overcome the desire to hold on to it. And it becomes also people derive perverse pleasure in that. So that happens. You start, you get a pleasure in making somebody feel miserable. And one of the things about, you know, they've done studies on cheerfulness and things and, and cheerfulness and good nature is very contagious if somebody is in a cheerful and a good nature they, they can actually affect other people much more powerfully than irritability although irritability is also contagious but it doesn't spread as easily as good 
nature. I mean, they've done really interesting studies about this, to watch this. And depression is difficult, very difficult to actually be transferred to somebody. It can happen. If you live with a depressed person, you, become, you can become depressed. But it's actually difficult for that to happen. It's quite unusual. But well-being does not. You can actually transform somebody's state quite easily if, if you're up and they're down and you can see this with children you know if children pout and do these things you can just with silly faces and things you can get them to break a smile and when you once you've got them there they know they can't hold on to it so it's interesting just breaking that that infantile desire and I think the Prophet Sallallahu was an absolute master like everything he did he was a master at that of breaking that uh, that state that people got into and it doesn't mean that he didn't have periods. There were difficult periods. But generally, that was what he did. Now, it's important to keep in mind that marital life, due to the constant interaction and to psycho-emotional states that people go through. We go through different psycho-emotional states throughout the day uh, or the week or the month. And that there's situations where discontent, displeasure occur. And you can do these things these are normal occurrences and, and even the Prophet Aisha the Prophet said to Aisha I know when you're upset with me and she said how do you know that and he said because when, when you're pleased with me you say Warabi Muhammad by the Lord of Muhammad but when you're upset with me you say Warabi Ibrahim by the Lord of Ibrahim <laughs> and Aisha laughed and she said that's true by Allah it's true I would never abandon anything but your name I mean, that's an example. And then also this idea that the Prophet ﷺ said a, a mu'min should never dislike a believer. If he, likes, if he dislikes one quality, he should focus on the qualities he likes. So every person is going to have things that bother you and things that you like about them. And the thing about your spouse is that you should look at those qualities that are pleasing. Also, the Prophet ﷺ said the most perfect of believers in faith are those with the most excellent character and the best of you are the best of you to your women and there's a beautiful poem by uh, Jalaluddin al-Rumi where he said the Prophet Sallallahu said that women totally dominate men of intellect and possessors of hearts but ignorant men dominate women for they are shackled by an animal ferocity they have no kindness, gentleness or love since animality dominates their nature. Love and kindness are human attributes. Anger and sensuality belong to the animals. That comes from a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ was talking to some women and he said, I've never seen a creature that has more possession over a man of intellect than you. So what Rumi was taking that to another level of understanding that the reason that they have so much power over is because these are people that have conquered their animal soul and so they're not people that are going to uh, dominate women uh, they're not people that are going to oppress they're actually people that because of the love and kindness that has overcome their souls they actually allow the women their shortcomings without demanding change and that's what Ibn Abbas said about the verse in the Quran that men have one degree over women that's what he said it was he said it was relinquishing the right of a man for the woman whereas he would not relinquish her rights in other words he would fulfill all of her rights but he would not demand of her all of his rights that that is the degree that men have over women and that's Ibn Abbas who's the translator of the Quran and one of the things also is just going the path of least resistance water puts out fire fire increases fire if you look at the Prophet وسلم, that that was his strategy with people Omar said I once roared at my wife and she answered back I rebuked her for bandying words with me she then said, why should you rebuke me for answering you back? By Allah, the wives of the Prophet dispute with him and even ignore him for a night and a day. So, you know, she was saying, who do you think you are? Basically, I mean, that's what it is. He's saying, who do you think you are? You know, 
the wives of the Prophet ﷺ do this to the Prophet. And he is the best example. So I think in that hadith, there's a real... And, and he went and indeed found that from Hafsa. He went and asked Hafsa, who was his daughter, do you do that? And he was shocked. But it changed his attitude. And we have when he was Khalifa, the man who came to his house, knocked on the door. And then he heard Omar's wife yelling at him. And he left. And Omar came out and said to him, what happened? He said, nothing. He said, no, you came, knocked on my door, what'd you want? He said, I didn't want anything. And he said, he said, by Allah, tell me what you want. He said, well, I was going to come complain about my wife. <laughs> but, but when I heard your wife, I said, there was no point in complaining to you. And Omar, he said, he said, this is my wife, the mother of my children. She maintains my house, cooks my food. Shouldn't I have patience with her if she gets upset with me? So there's the man who, you know, r roared. That, that's the change that occurred in him. And, and that's the point. People can change. Now we go to the shared rights of both the wife and the husband. The first shared right is called Husn al-Ishra. And this is the most important one because this is the foundation of a good marriage. Husn al-Ishra is beautiful companionship. In other words, each spouse has the right to live with the other spouse in which they are actually treated very well. So this is a mutual right. In other words, the wife has a right to be treated beautifully by her husband. It's a haq. It's a right. And the, the husband has a right to be treated beautifully by his wife. That's called husn al-ishra. And that there are verses about that. Treat them with kindness. Aisha radiallahu relates a sound transmission that the Prophet sallallahu said, I am to you. It's a famous hadith about uh, Abu Zara and Umm Zara. It's a very beautiful hadith. There's whole books have been written just on this hadith alone. And it's a hadith where the Prophet describes these wives talking about their husbands. Each one says something about her husband. And then it comes to Umm Zara and she starts talking about Abu Zara and how wonderful he was. And her life was just heaven and bliss with uh, Abu Zara. And, and then she just, the one thing happens is that he marries another woman who was very beautiful and Umm Zara became very jealous and ended up causing a divorce to happen. And then she married another man, but he was nothing compared to Abu Zara. And she really regretted it. And in the end, the Prophet ﷺ said to Aisha, I'm like Abu Zara to your Umm Zara. And what he was telling her was, we have a very beautiful relationship, so don't destroy it by your jealousy, uh, because uh, you'll regret it. And, and I think that that, I mentioned that last week, just about the fact that all of his wives, none of them wanted a divorce from him. And there was difficulty in the household. It wasn't, it wasn't a bed of, bed of roses. There was difficulty. They had their human troubles that go with the domestic situation all that was part of for us but also for the full experience of the human life that the Prophet ﷺ lived in terms of what engenders and facilitates these relationships one is really important is Islamic etiquette so it's very important just to remember that just like your brother you're supposed to greet them with a smile you're supposed to I mean these things you do with people outside sometimes we forget that the people we're living with have more right than other people to those same etiquettes and also doing things for each other ethar preferring the other to the self this idea and the thing about it is men have to be very careful because there are many women that that is their nature right so in other words a man can get into a very exploitive relationship with his wife because his wife by her nature uh, especially women that were born in a, uh, and raised in a more eastern tradition where there's a lot of um, double standards uh, with the male and the female children. You can get into an exploitive relationship with the wife where you're allowing her to do everything and she says, oh, well, I love to do it. Well, 
that doesn't mean that she should be doing everything because she loves to do it because she's getting all the reward first of all and second of all she's going to appreciate no matter what she says when you help her out and do things for her she will appreciate it because that's human nature so just maintaining the etiquette and then also a wife should not allow domestic concerns so that she forgets her own husband and then becomes like a domestic servant too because that can happen woman becomes so preoccupied that uh, she becomes more like a domestic servant and not realizing that there's a whole sakina there should be spiritual relationships spiritual growth between the two things like that and uh, a man also has to be very careful of not get, getting into the and this is all about I mean I'll really tell you in all honesty I mean the thing about life is the challenge for everybody is not to fall asleep uh, and it's really easy to just get into these patterns of perfunctory behavior and to forget what uh, you know what life is about and you can really forget that this is it you know your life is an aggregate of moments and that when you're with your wife or your husband it can either be a horrible experience it can be a wonderful experience or it can be a missed experience right John Lennon said life is what happens when you're busy making other plans and there's a lot of truth in that. You, know, you, you can be, get so caught up in these day-to-day -day concerns that life passes you by and you missed it. So family is like that. Your children are like that. It's very easy to, uh, to lose sight of that.